This is a University of Otago podcast. Welcome everyone and thank you for coming along, particularly students here who have got exams, that's very impressive, A plus for that, fantastic. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Jane Ginsberg all the way from New York. Um, Jane is the Law Foundation Distinguished Fellow and will be travelling around all the universities in New Zealand and this is her time at Otago which we're really enjoying very much. Uh, those who don't know about Jane, she's internationally recognised for her expertise in copyright law, which she'll be talking about tonight. She's the Morton L. Yanklow Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia University School of Law and the Faculty Director of its Kernikan Centre for Law, Media and the Arts. Jane actually teaches legal methods, which is legal system here, copyright law and trademarks law. She's written a number of books, um, one with Professor A. Gorman, which is the co-author of Copyright Concepts and Insights, and one with Professor Sam Ricketson from Melbourne, International Copyright and Neighbouring Rights, the Boone Convention and beyond. Other books include several uh, volumes on domestic international copyright and trademark law. With Professor Dreyfus and Professor Francois Desimonte, uh, she was a co-reporter for the um, very important piece of work, the um, American Law Institute Project on Intellectual Property, Principles Governing Jurisdiction, Choice of Law and Judgments in Transnational Disputes. Jane is a graduate of the University of Chicago with a BA in 1976 and MA in 1977. She received a JD in 1980 from Harvard and a Diploma d'études et profondes in 1985 and a Doctorate of Law in 1995 from the University of Paris too. She's a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, a member of the American Philosophical Society and an honorary fellow of Emmanuel College, University of Cambridge. So we're very honoured to have such a distinguished guest in our midst tonight. So it's given me great pleasure to invite you, Jane, to address us on a really interesting topic, from Hypatia to Victor Hugo, to Larry and Sergey, all the world's knowledge and universal author's rights. Please give Jane a big welcome. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to be spending a couple of intense days here uh, at the law faculty of the University of uh, Otago. I have uh, very much enjoyed spending time uh, at, the, at the faculty, and I thank you for coming to this lecture. Access to all the world's knowledge is an ancient aspiration, a less venerable but equally vigorous universalism strives for the borderless protection of authors' rights. Late 19th century law and politics implemented copyright universalism. 21st century technology may bring us the universal digital library and with it a clash of utopian yearnings if culture freely accessed comes to mean culture unremunerated. Does the universal digital library of the near future threaten copyright holders, particularly book publishers? Lest we sound too soon the dirge for traditional publishers and newer commercial distribution intermediaries, we should remember that digital media may enhance access to culture, but culture freed from its former masters may not yet be free. Access triumphalism may bring us not the universal digital library, but the universal digital bookstore. In this talk, I will first evoke two utopian goals, universal access to knowledge and universal author's rights. The former inspired a, implied a curator custodian, a public institution that would gather, systematize, and make available the world's knowledge. The latter enforced private prerogative through the international recognition of authors' property rights that arise from their creativity or are justified by the public benefits those creations bestow. Creators and custodians of knowledge long pursued complementary aims, despite occasional skirmishes between copyright owners and libraries. That now may be changing. In the last part of this talk, I will address the clash of utopias epitomized by the Google book scanning program and the legal responses it has inspired or provoked. Finally, 
as we query whether through mass digitization, libraries will replace publishers or vice versa. We should not lose sight of the authors who are both copyright's raison d'etre and the necessary forebears of libraries. For without works of authorship to stock the collection, there is nothing to curate. Let's start with a Cook's tour of custodians and curators from the Library of Alexandria, whence, whoops, wrong way. Whence this talk's invocation of Hypatia. I don't know if anybody saw this movie um, with Rachel Weiss portraying the, um, uh, the not entirely mythical librarian of Alexandria. Uh, to the Renaissance and the late 19th century, to new technologies of the 20th century, 21st century, culminating in the recently debuted Digital Public Library of America. Utopian dreams of a universal archive of knowledge almost always refer to the Library of Alexandria. It is often described as a universal library, according to a second century BC document from the Jewish community of Alexandria, its mission was to collect all the books in the world. Commentators throughout antiquity and early Christianity similarly evoked the comprehensive aspirations of the library. The American classicist and historian Roger Bagnall has described the persistent power of the idea of the Library of Alexandria. He wrote, the Library of Alexandria has bequeathed the image of itself, the idea of a large comprehensive library embracing all of knowledge. Although the authors whose work survived antiquity told posterity little of any concrete substance about the library, they transmitted its indelible impression on their imagination. Moving ahead some 1,500 years, with the advent of the printing press and the vast increase in the range of books new and old that it enabled, no single place could unite all literary and scientific productions. The urge to comprehensive knowledge did not abate, however. Rather, it spawned a new kind of collection and systematization, the thematic catalog. For example, in 1550, the Florentine man of letters and bibliographer Anton Francesco Doni published in Venice his Libraria, subtitled, in which are inscribed all the vernacular authors with 100 discussions of them, as well as all the translations made from other languages into ours and an index generally laid out according to the customs of booksellers. That's all that text you see before the <laughs> phrase con privilegio. Doni seems to have become obsessed with his task for a subsequent printing from 1550 tells us that it is newly reprinted, corrected, and with many things added that were missing. In 1557, the indefatigable Doni produced a second edition, featuring an even more prolix subtitle, informing us that his work now consists of three treatises, and stating, in part, that the second treatise includes Doni's more recent listings of the authors, the works, the titles, and the substance, and assures us that his book is necessary and useful to all those who need knowledge of our language and wish to know how to write and think about all the authors, their books, and their works. The Libraria went through further editions even following Doni's death as successive publishers sought to satisfy a vigorous demand for this kind of compendium. Thus, a 1580 edition tax on to Doni's run-on title, the information that to the current printing have been added all the vernacular works published in the last 30 years in Italy. However, in a punctilious nod to the Counter-Reformation, 
the 1580 edition subtitle also cautions and having removed all the prohibited authors and books. We skip forward to the end of the 19th century where we encounter Belgian lawyer and visionary Paul Hautelet, a spiritual descendant of Dony, but by a power of 10 at least. <laughs> he imagined a universal book of knowledge in which Quote, all knowledge, all information could be so condensed that it could be contained in a limited number of works placed on a desk, therefore within hand's reach, and indexed in such a way as to ensure maximum consultability. I'm not sure this picture was what he had in mind. <laughs> in this case, the world, the world described in the entirety of books, he continued, would really be within everyone's grasp. The universal book created from all books would become very approximately an annex to the brain, a substratum even of memory, an external mechanism, an instrument of the mind, but so close to it, so apt to its use, that it would truly be a sort of appended organ, an exodermic appendage. Sounds like science fiction, only today's futurist would house the information in an endodermic appendix, such as a brain embedded microchip to which information could be uploaded a la matrix. Otley's frenzied efforts to capture and catalog all the world's knowledge produced real information processing improvements too. He invented the great search tool of libraries of yore, the once ubiquitous system of index card files on rods in pull-out drawers in library cabinets. Anybody remember these? If so, you're dating yourself. <laughs> and with over 12 million of those index cards, he created an archive he called the Mundanium, which he saw as a successor to the Library of Alexandria, the Summa of Aquinas, the Encyclopédie, and all the world's great libraries, museums, and world expositions put together. He really thought small. We might perceive it as a kind of Google avant la lettre. Audley declared that the Mundanium is about gathering, condensing, classifying, coordinating, finally to represent and to reproduce. The Mundanium still exists physically in Mons, Belgium, and virtually at www.mundanium.org. Perhaps fittingly, it benefits from Google's sponsorship. Audley also in co-invented microfilm a new technology that far exceeded his principal bibliographic efforts. This new convenient and compressed storage medium could enable libraries both to preserve fragile volumes and to increase their collections while occupying far less shelf space. With microfilm, we go beyond summarizing the contents of books to return to the original utopian aspiration of gathering all the world's books themselves. But at this point, the visionaries address the possibility that all this content could come within the grasp not only of institutions, but also of individuals. In 1945, Vannevar Bush, who as the director of the wartime United States Office of Scientific Research and Development was one of the forces behind the Manhattan Project, contemplated the revolutionary promise of microfilm. In a noted essay published in the Atlantic Magazine in the closing months of World War II, Bush proposed a Memex, a private device for information storage and retrieval that by responding to and storing the associations that the human mind produces would transcend the artificiality of systems of indexing used in libraries. Bush described the device and its capacities as follows. A memex is a device in which an individual stores all his books, records, and communications and which is mechanized so that it may be consulted with exceeding speed and flexibility, 
It is an enlarged, intimate supplement to his memory. Note the memory su supplements metaphor, recalling the Otletian exodermic appendage of the mind. Mechanical storage adjuncts to the brain join the Library of Alexandria as a top metaphor for the bibliographically inclined. Bush continued, it consists of a desk, and while it can presumably be operated from a distance, it is primarily the place, piece of furniture at which he works. On the top are slanting translucent screens on which material can be projected for convenient reading. There is a keyboard and sets of buttons and levers, otherwise it looks like an ordinary desk. In one end is the stored material. The matter of bulk is well taken care of by improved microfilm. Only a small part of the interior of the Memex is devoted to storage, the rest to mechanism. Yet, if the user inserted 5,000 pages of material a day, it would take him hundreds of years to fill the repository so he can be profligate and enter material freely. From the photographic impressions of microfilm to today's digital scanning, the prospects for the great and universally accessible compendium of content are en route to realization. Indeed, the Digital Public Library of America launched in April 2013. At a lecture at Columbia Law School in the spring of 2012, Robert Darton, Harvard University librarian, renowned historian of the book and leading instigator of the DPLA, declared, we know that we want the DPLA to serve a broad constituency, not just faculty and research universities, but students in community colleges, ordinary readers, K through 12 school children, seniors in retirement communities, anyone and everyone with an interest in books. Darton is confident that the DPLA will overcome any technological and funding impediments. There remains the stumbling block of copyright. Many of those interesting books are still under copyright, and sorting through the rights clearance may prove daunting, if not intractable. But we will return to those problems after we consider how copyright, with its own universalist aspirations, comes into the picture. Before copyright, the printing press gave rise to printing privileges issued by territorial sovereigns to protect and encourage investment in the material and labor of printing. But each sovereign's power to protect the nascent book trade extended only to the limits of its realm. Publishers, or authors, for authors too, obtained privileges, who envisioned multi-territorial distribution would seek multiple privileges, for example, from the French king, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the various Italian principalities. But papal privileges, of which this is one, defied territoriality. They purported to cover all of Christendom, and their sanctions included confiscation of infringing copies and automatic excommunication, a truly extraterritorial <laughs> remedy. We are, however, in the 16th century, and the efficacy of excommunication may not have been what once it was. Even the Pope and the privilege-granting cardinal secretary of papal briefs probably would not have expected a new canossa of legions of penitent infringers barefoot in the snow, begging absolution and surrendering their pirate wares. So the cautious publisher or author, Ariosto among them for the Orlando Furioso, would have sought the prestige of a papal privilege, but would also have continued to petition all likely sovereigns for the special grace of an exclusive privilege prohibiting the unauthorized printing, selling, or importation of their works. By the 18th and 19th centuries, with the advent of true copyright law, that is, exclusive rights vesting in authors, exclusive rights are no longer a matter of special grace, but have become property rights justified by the author's intellectual labor as well as by the interests of the polity. 
Property rationales also fueled the endeavors starting in the mid 19th century to achieve the goal of universal international protection of authors' rights. Rising literacy, both literary and musical, had by then contributed to an international market for works of authorship, but copyright owners still found their rights confined to national borders. Bilateral treaties arose to grant protection on the basis of reciprocity, but obtaining coverage for multiple territories remained complex and cumbersome. Composers particularly found themselves attempting multiple simultaneous first publication in several countries in order to endow their works with local protection. International copyright concerns motivated Gilbert and Sullivan to manipulate the nationality of their work by arranging for the Pirates of Penzance to debut in New York City in 1879 because the US did not then protect foreign works. Effective international protection required multilateral, multinational cooperation, not only to recognize foreign works, but also to protect them on non-discriminatory terms. In 1858, the first great international congress on literary and artistic property took place in Brussels with over 300 delegates, including Charles Dickens, John Stuart Mill, Eugène Scribe, and Alphonse de Lamartine, among many other luminaries. The Congress declared, quote, the principle that the national recognition of the author's property in their works of literature and of art should be established in the laws of all civilized peoples. Lest one think that copyright universalism also means copyright maximalism, setting greedy copyright owners against the broader public interest, it is worth observing that the Brussels delegates also asserted, with Gallic grandiloquence, the necessity to proclaim as a fundamental principle the uniform, universal, and international recognition of intellectual property. The enjoyment of this property should be broadly guaranteed, but within reasonable limits, in order to pour into the common stock of human intelligence the treasures by which those elite spirits, after their temporary profit, receive forever the honor and the glory and the gratitude of mankind. Twenty years later, however, authors' rights remained bounded by national borders, freighted with formalities and prey to international piracy. And so began another universalist push propelled by the outsized celebrity of Victor Hugo, who presided over the 1878 International Literary Congress in Paris. <laughs> this gathering, which also featured the participation of Ivan Turgenev, gave birth to the Association Littéraire et Artistique Internationale, ALAI, the principal moving force behind the 1886 Berne Convention and its subsequent revisions. The Berne Convention remains the preeminent multilateral copyright treaty and the predominant expression of copyright universalism. Victor Hugo made several speeches in the course of the 1878 Congress, often at a rather high level of abstraction and an even higher level of oratory about truth, beauty, and civilization, literature, and human progress. But he also pronounced on copyright in terms echoed today by scholars such as New Zealand's own Graham Austin, who remind us that authors' rights are human rights. Victor Hugo declared, literary property is in the public interest. All the old monarchic laws have rejected and continue to reject literary property. To what end? In order to enslave. The writer who is an owner of his literary property is a writer who is free. To take his property away is to deprive him of his independence. Like his predecessors in Brussels, Victor Hugo was a copyright universalist, but not an absolutist. Let us establish the principle of the respect of property. Let us affirm literary property, he exclaimed, but at the same time, let us also establish the public domain. 
the Congress voted several resolutions, including the declaration that the author's rights over his work constitute not a grant made by law, but one of the forms of property that the legislator must guarantee. For our purposes, tracing the evolution of universal author's rights, perhaps the most important development in the history of the Bern Union was the revision Congress held in Berlin in 1908. It established the dual principles of absence of formalities, conditioning the existence and enforcement of copyright, and the independence of international and domestic protection. Formalities are conditions prerequisite, such as registration or publication of claims or national library deposit of copies. In the 19th century, an author would have had to have complied with the formalities of each country for which he sought protection, assuming that country, what, the country of which the author was not a national, extended any protection at all to foreign claimants. Proper compliance was cumbersome, costly, and often unsuccessful. Hence, authors' demands, as early as the 1858 Brussels Congress, that authors be protected in all countries so long as they satisfied whatever formalities their home countries imposed. The 1886 and 1896 versions of the Berne Convention adopted that approach. But in practice, it turned out to be difficult to prove to foreign authorities that the author had complied with her home country's formalities. As a result, the 1908 Berlin revision prohibited the imposition of formalities on foreign authors altogether and provided that union authors would be assimilated to local authors in every member state. The effect of the Berlin revision was to confer copyright throughout the Bern Union automatically and upon creation on every convention covered work created by an author who was a national of a Bern Union member state or first published in a member state. The Bern Union today is composed of over 165 member states, not many holdouts there. Inclu those states include the United States, of, of which I am a national. As a result of the Berlin revision and subsequent US adherence to the Bern Convention, the moment I created this lecture, it enjoyed copyright protection in over 165 countries outside the United States without any obligation that I fill out any forms or pay any registration fees to authorities in any one of those countries. So all those blue bits are mine. <laughs> this is indeed the universal coverage for which Dickens and Mill in 1858 and Victor Hugo and Ivan Turgenev in 1878 yearned. This brings us to the clash of universalist aspirations. How can all the world's knowledge, there's Larry and Sergei, they brought us that phrase, including that expressed in works whose copyrights have not expired, be delivered on demand to users anywhere in the world with internet access if the copyrights of the creators and publishers of those works are supposed to exist and be enforceable almost everywhere in the world. You may by now be familiar with the general outlines of the Google book scanning program inaugurated in 2004. Google scanned the contents of participating US university libraries, one of which the University of Michigan authorized Google to reproduce and to store digital copies of in-copyright works. The other libraries had limited Google to their public domain collection. The scanned text was converted to a searchable format allowing users to query Google's database and retrieve, in addition to basic bibliographic information, two to three line snippets of text setting the searched term in its immediate textual context. Google would not display a greater amount of text without agreement from right holders. But Google did and does retain complete copies of millions of the in copyright scanned books in its database. Google also returned to each participating library a fully scanned copy of that library's holdings. In 2005, 
the Authors Guild brought a class action and a group of publishers brought a separate action against Google alleging massive copyright infringement through the copying and storage of full text and the communication to the public of snippets of text. Google boldly replied that the US fair use exception to copyright sheltered its program and all the parties began settlement negotiations. In 2011, the Federal District Court for the Southern District of New York declined to approve the class action settlement, largely because of the immense advantage the settlement would have conferred on Google relative to competitors who sought permission before scanning in copyright books. Following the court's rejection of the class action settlement, Google reached a separate settlement with the publishers, but its terms remain undisclosed. With the rejection of the class action settlement that would have allowed display of substantial portions of the book's text, Google's program with respect to unauthorized copies maintained its original guise of providing bibliographic information and displays of snippets of text in response to user search queries, as well as access to the database of scanned books for purposes of data mining. The output put Google Books users encounter either eschews copyrightable expression or consists of very short extracts. Last November, the District Court for the Southern District of New York ruled Google's book scanning to be fair use. Several of the reasons the court gave in support of its fair use ruling evoked the book scanning program's benefits to libraries in general beyond the provision to each supplier library of scanned copies of its holdings. Google's bibliographic information provides links to libraries and to bookstores where the physical book may be found. According to Judge Chin, Google Books has become an essential research tool. The Authors Guild has appealed Judge Chin's ruling, but in the interim, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which sits above the Southern District of New York, rendered its decision in another controversy stemming from the Google book scanning program. Authors Guild versus Hathi Trust involved the, the use by the University of Michigan Library of its copy of the database Google had created from that library's collections. The Second Circuit announced a broad fair use privilege to create and store digital copies of entire books for purposes of data mining of full text. Looking at the output of data in response to search queries rather than the input of the full contents of books into the database, the court found the data mining uses did not generate any output of copyrightable expression and the nature of the use corresponded to a purpose entirely different from those covered by more conventional uses. The court therefore concluded that there was no impact of the use on the potential market for the books that this market might be one that copyright owners would come to develop apparently does not matter. The court gave short shrift to the author's contended economic harm from lost licensing opportunities. Hathi Trust and Google Books appear to be cases in which the court perceived the public benefit to be so compelling and the market harm so trivial that the use should be free of restraint and free of charge even if it could be licensed. The cynical might say that the courts have conscripted authors and publishers to uncompensated partnership with libraries in the pursuit of socially laudatory objectives. Returning to Google Books, the Hathi Trust decision leaves the smart money betting on an affirmance of Judge Chin's decision but it bears emphasis that the scope of the Google Books and Hathi Trust programs as ultimately adjudicated fell far short of establishing a digital lending library of Alexandria. Google servers may now house an Alexandrian digital storage library whose principal beneficiary may in fact be Google. The program the courts endorsed consists largely of a magnificently performing interactive catalog of books out of print. I do not mean to belittle the data mining function, on the contrary, but we should be clear 
that Google's and HathiTrust victories do not mean that either may now deliver all the world's knowledge in book form to the internet-enabled computers of would-be readers. Had the Google Books class action settlement been approved by contrast, it might at least in the short run have approximated the Alexandrian aspirations of the internet enabled, because in addition to generally providing full text copies of copyright expired works, as to which Alexandria may already have been achieved, thanks to Google, it would have offered various levels of access to millions of in copyright books. For copyright protected books not commercially available, in other words, out of print books, users would have seen up to 20% of the text under the standard preview. Moreover, users could have viewed full text of in copyright but out of print works through universities and libraries who would have obtained institutional subscriptions from Google. And non-scholarly users could have viewed full books under a special access service public access service provided free to public libraries and to not-for-profit higher education institutions at a specified number of terminals. Thus, Google would have partnered with libraries, not just the libraries whose collections Google scanned, to give the public access to the entire contents of in-copyright out-of-print works. So where's the rub? Google is not a charitable institution. In addition to the competition concerns that undergirded the rejection of the class action settlement, Google's dominant position presents other threats. Harvard University librarian Robert Darnton doubtless expressed the fears of many institutional librarians when he cautioned that the price of the institutional subscription could have risen precipitously putting libraries in the same kind of pricing stranglehold they complain of today regarding the scientific journal publishers. Moreover, with or without the class action settlement and beyond the low baseline of Judge Chin's and the Second Circuit's fair use rulings, the level of access via libraries or online bookstores to commercially available in copyright books, i.e. current titles, depends on agreements with the right holders. If an author or publisher wishes to make her work freely available for free or against advertising revenue, she may do so with or without Google. And right holders who want to be paid have authorized Google and Amazon and others to sell ebook versions of in copyright titles. Indeed, they were doing so even before Google began its massive unauthorized scanning. As to current titles then, the market for electronic access via Google or others is well underway. But what about libraries? We have seen that the digital environment can sometimes put libraries in competition with publishers. But in considering ways in which libraries might compete with publishers, we have been assuming that given the choice between free and paid access, the public will prefer free. The assumption, however, turns on equivalent levels of access. If copyright holders limit the level of free access that libraries may provide, and the law limits that level as well, but publishers make full text available for a fee or against advertising revenue, the commercial option may seem more attractive. I suspect that especially among those here present, at least those professorial sorts here present, I am, not the, uh, I am not alone in having occasionally to point to physical books to remind students that they might need to go to the library to consult these artifacts because not everything is available on the net. As publishers or other intermediaries increase the offer of ebooks, if they do not also authorize libraries to offer remote access, the library's public may shrink to vintage scholars intoxicated by the smell of aging paper. <laughs> Lest one think that the posited hybrid digital library bookstore is fanciful, let's return to Google. In Atletian Back to the Future fashion, the Google Books Library Project is subtitled 
an enhanced card catalog of the world's books. It offers full text of public domain books and limited or no views of in print in copyright books. These restrictions may reflect the undisclosed terms of the settlement with the publishers. And the library project includes not only links to libraries that house the books, but also links to online bookstores to buy the book. The future Alexandrian repository of digitized books, therefore, may take many forms, not all of them in line with the original public curator custodian model. Whether public or private, however, Alexandria's <coughs> virtual lending library shelves need to be stocked with more than public domain works and current ebooks. The difficulties arise from books still in copyright, but which their authors or publishers are no longer making available, whether commercially or for free. The copyright term is very long in many countries, including the US and those of the EU, but not New Zealand. It endures for 70 years after the author's death. But book's commercial life generally is far shorter. For the vast bulk of books, copyright owners may, after five or 10 years, have exhausted a hard copy book's likely revenue stream. I specify hard copy because a book in digital form can be offered on demand. So a publisher may keep it commercially available for individualized delivery and thus take advantage of the persistent trickle of sales that the so-called long tail phenomenon promises. As a result, the problem of unavailable books may be transitional, but for now, there are undoubtedly millions of out of print in copyright books existing only in hard copy format. How are these works to be digitized? Conversion to digital format is the prerequisite to bringing these works under the aegis of the virtual library of Alexandria, but it is not clear who can or will exercise the rights to scan and store and make full text available. With respect to publishers, we can anticipate at least two problems. First, disinclination to reinvent Google's wheel by committing the resources to scanning all the in-copyright books they've ever published, though those costs may be diminishing. Second, and more significantly, for older books, the rights may have reverted to the authors, or the publisher may never have acquired digital rights. And therefore, without reaching a new agreement with the author, the publisher can't unilaterally digitize and disseminate or authorize third parties to do so. What about the authors? In addition to the resource problem of the cost of scanning, the older the book is, the harder the author or her heirs may be to find. Or the heirs may have been fruitful and multiplied. And depending on the competent national law, if the author is dead, it may be necessary to obtain a majority or even unanimity of the heirs agreement. What about libraries? If the book is already in the library's collection, some national laws may allow the library to digitize for preservation or for making available on library premises. But it is less clear that without an applicable copyright exception, the library could digitize to make full text available on the scale our Alexandrian project envisions. Even if fair use is seeming quite cavernous today, we should recall that Judge Chin emphasized that Google Books promoted the sale of books because the limited access Google offered did not enable libraries to substitute their services for remote full text access to the scanned books. What might an adequate library exception look like? As a first principle, with which many may not agree, Libraries should not compete with publishers or for that matter with self-publishing authors. Ascertaining what compete with means, of course, is not an obvious endeavor. We might take library publisher coexistence in the hard copy world as a starting point. And some publishers have indeed attempted to replicate the limitations of that world in the digital environment. For example, by imposing ebook licensing conditions that limit library provision of access to 26 loans. That number of loans apparently corresponds 
to the amount of wear and tear a hard copy book can sustain before the library will need to replace it with the purchase of a new hard copy. But it seems a waste of the potential of digital media to restrict its dissemination to the lesser capacities of hard copies. Library publisher agreements should give the public at least some of the benefits of the convenience that the digital medium can provide. On the other hand, the digital world also offers authors and publishers new opportunities for individualized commercialization of the backlist of books or portions of books. Free remote delivery by libraries might compromise this emerging market. As a result, it may be necessary either to forego the full potential of digital media in order to limit the number of simultaneous remote readers, or to devise a means of compensating authors and publishers for those readers. In the European Union, the public lending right has long generated compensation for hard copy library lending. And national libraries in EU member states, including the UK and the Netherlands, have taken the position that they are permitted under the public lending right to engage in ebook lending on a one copy, one reader basis. That question is now before the European Court of Justice on a reference from the Court of Appeals of The Hague. Libraries have not yet, however, asserted an entitlement to allow multiple readers simultaneous access to a digital file. As as the EU member states address the adaptation of the public lending right to the digital environment, other countries might also consider whether to adopt similar measures. Second, any library exception should favor the creation of otherwise unavailable digitized versions. As the publisher's agreement with Google suggests, it is possible to cover some of the universe of extant hard copies by negotiated agreements albeit not necessarily negotiated with libraries. The older the book, however, the more elusive a negotiated solution because the necessary parties may not be around to be represented. A so-called moving wall at the back end of the copyright term, as Professor Darton has suggested, may offer an appealing application of the opt-out technique, allowing public libraries both to digitize and to disseminate during the last years of the copyright term subject to objection by copyright holders. Moreover, for, cop for countries with life plus 70 terms, imposing an opt-out solution for the last 20 years would not contravene Berne Convention norms because the conventional copyright term is life plus 50. 50 years post-mortem auctoris, which is the term here in New Zealand, is nonetheless a very long time. And so an opt-out approach, perhaps combined with statutory remuneration, is worth considering in order to enable public libraries to make the digital books available remotely for some greater portion of the post-mortem copyright term. Third, for any exception that includes statutory remuneration, authors or their heirs should be the recipients. The law should presume that in the absence of proof by the publisher that it holds the digital rights in whole or in part, the money should go to the author. In conclusion, the digital era is bringing us a convergence of the functions of library and of publisher. The blurring of their roles has prompted some to panic that Google has gained an unfair advantage in the digital book market. But in the race to catch up, we should take care lest hastily cobbled legislation advance the interests neither of libraries nor of authors. We do not need copyright legislation that simply transposes the sloganeering that has poisoned the public debates over copyright. Whether in international, EU, or national fora, much of the discourse in the copyright field has been hair-rendingly dismal. We need to leave off the mannequin posturing in general, and in particular, to endeavor carefully to work through the respective domains of copyright holders and public libraries so that free, public, digital lending libraries may continue to develop and also 
so that authors may reap the benefits both of broad dissemination and commensurate remuneration. Thank you.